Hi everybody, welcome back. Today we'll be looking at the United States experience during the years that marked the First World War, or what Europeans called simply the Great War. American leaders in the 20th century often discussed issues of foreign policy in quite a paradoxical way. A supreme faith in the nation's historic destiny and in the righteousness of its ideals enabled many to think of the United States as the worldwide embodiment of freedom and as an emerging great power at the same time. More than any other individual, Woodrow Wilson, who we have another image of here, articulated this vision of America's relationship to the rest of the world. Wilson's foreign policy, called by historians and political scientists liberal internationalism, rested on the conviction that economic and political progress went hand in hand. According to this rationale, greater worldwide freedom would follow inevitably from increased American investment and trade abroad. Frequently, over the course of the 20th century, this conviction would serve as a mask for American power and self-interest. It would also inspire sincere efforts to bring freedom to other peoples. In either case, liberal internationalism represented a shift from the 19th century tradition of promoting freedom by example rather than active intervention to make the world over in the American image. Just as they expanded the powers of the federal government in domestic affairs, the progressive presidents were not reluctant to project American power outside the country's borders. At first, their interventions were confined to the Western Hemisphere, whose affairs the United States had claimed a special right to oversee ever since the Monroe Doctrine of 1823. Between 1901 and 1920, U.S. Marines landed in Caribbean countries more than 20 times. Usually they were dispatched to create a welcoming economic environment for American companies that wanted stable access to raw materials, such as bananas and sugar, and for bankers nervous that their loans to local governments might not be repaid. Theodore Roosevelt, who we have again here in this photo, became far more active in international diplomacy than most of his predecessors. The idea of a canal across the 51 mile wide isthmus of Panama had a long history. A longtime proponent of American naval development, Roosevelt was convinced that a canal would facilitate the movement of naval and commercial vessels between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. In 1903, when Colombia, of which Panama at the time was a part, refused to cede land for the project, Roosevelt helped set in motion an uprising in Panama. An American gunboat prevented the Colombian army from suppressing the revolt, which led to the country's independence. Panama subsequently signed a treaty giving the United States both the right to construct and to operate a canal, as well as sovereignty over the Canal Zone, as it was called, a 10-mile wide strip of land through which the route would, would run. Here we have an image from the ceremonial opening of the Panama Canal in 1914. A truly remarkable feat of engineering. The canal was the largest construction project in history to that date. 
like the building of the Transcontinental Railroad in the 1860s and much construction today. It involved the widespread use of immigrant labor. Most of the 60,000 workers came from the Caribbean islands of Barbados and Jamaica, but others hailed from Europe, Asia, and the United States. Here in this photograph, we see some of the laborers who built the Panama Canal. When it was finished toward the end of 1914, as Roosevelt had predicted, the canal reduced the sea voyage between the east and west coasts of the United States by some 8,000 miles. Roosevelt's actions in Panama reflected a principle that came to be known as the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. This held that the United States had the right to exercise an international police power in the Western Hemisphere, a significant expansion of the Monroe Doctrine, which only pledged to defend the hemisphere against European intervention. In 1904, Roosevelt ordered American forces to seize the customs houses of the Dominican Republic in order to ensure payment of its debts to European and American investors. In 1906, he dispatched troops to Cuba to oversee a disputed election, where they remained until 1909. Roosevelt's successor, William Howard Taft, who we have another image of here. Man, that was a big boy. He landed Marines in Nicaragua to protect a government friendly to American economic interests. In general, though, Taft emphasized economic investment and loans from American banks rather than direct military intervention as the best way to spread American influence. As a result, his foreign policy became known as dollar diplomacy. Woodrow Wilson brought to the presidency a missionary zeal and a sense of his own and the nation's moral righteousness. He'd promised a new foreign policy that would respect Latin America's independence and free it from foreign economic domination. But Wilson could not abandon the conviction that the United States had a responsibility to teach other peoples what he saw as the lessons of democracy. Wilson's moral imperialism, as scholars characterize his foreign policy, produced more military interventions in Latin America than any president before or since. In 1915, as we can see in these couple of images, he sent Marines to occupy Haiti after the government there refused to allow American banks to oversee its financial dealings. The next year, in 1916, as we can see captured in this photo, he sent the Marines in again, this time to set up a military government in the Dominican Republic. U.S. forces would remain there until 1924, and in Haiti until 1934. Wilson's foreign policy underscored a paradox of modern American history in that the presidents who spoke the loudest about freedom were most often the ones who intervened in the affairs of other countries. Wilson's major preoccupation in Latin America was Mexico, where in 1911, a revolution led by Francisco Madero, who we see in this image, 
overthrew the government of the dictator, Porfirio Diaz, who we have here. Two years later, without Wilson's knowledge, but with the backing of the U.S. ambassador and of American companies that controlled Mexico's oil and mining industries, a military commander named Victoriano Huerta, captured in this photograph, assassinated Madero and seized power. The president was appalled. He said he would have to teach Latin Americans to elect good men. When civil war subsequently broke out in Mexico, Wilson ordered American troops to land at Veracruz to prevent the arrival of rep weapons that were meant for Huerta's forces. But to the president's surprise, the Mexicans greeted the Marines as invaders rather than liberators. In 1916, the conflict spilled over into the United States when Pancho Villa, the leader of one of the factions fighting in the Civil War that we see here in this image, attacked Columbus, New Mexico, where he killed 17 Americans. Wilson ordered 10,000 troops into northern Mexico on an expedition that unsuccessfully sought to arrest Villa. Mexico proved to be a warning. In other words, that it might be difficult to use American might to reorder the affairs of other nations. It was in June 1914 that a Serbian nationalist, Gavrilo Princip, assassinated the Archduke, Franz Ferdinand, heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and his wife in Sarajevo, Bosnia. The deed captured in this series of images and on the front page of the New York Times, set in motion a chain of events that plunged Europe into the most devastating war the world had ever seen. In the years before 1914, European nations had engaged in a scramble to obtain colonial possessions overseas and had constructed a shifting series of alliances seeking military domination within Europe. In just over a month, as a result of this series of interlocking military alliances, Britain, France, Russia, and Japan, subsequently just known as the Allies, found themselves at war with Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire of Turkey and the Middle East, a triumvirate that came to be known as the Central Powers. When the fighting started, German forces quickly overran Belgium and part of northern France. The conflict then settled into a prolonged stalemate with incredibly bloody indecisive battles succeeding one another. New military technologies led not just to bigger weapons, an idea of which we can get from this massive gun of the period, but much more lethal ones, including submarines, airplanes, machine guns, tanks, and most ominously for the future, poison gas. They all produced unprecedented slaughter and what Europeans came to call, and not without cause, the Great War. By the time it was over, some 10 million soldiers and uncounted millions of civilians had perished. To make matters worse still, the war was followed by widespread famine and a global pandemic of influenza that killed over 20 million more people. 
the First World War dealt a severe blow to the optimism and self-confidence of Western civilization. For decades, philosophers, reformers, and politicians had hailed the triumph of reason and human progress, an outlook that was hard to reconcile with the mass slaughter of the First World War. As war engulfed Europe, Americans of the time found themselves sharply divided. British Americans sided with their nation of origin, as did many other Americans who associated Great Britain with liberty and democracy, and Germany with repressive government. On the other hand, German Americans identified with their country of origin, and Irish Americans bitterly opposed any aid to the British. Immigrants from the Russian Empire, especially Jews, had no desire to see the United States support the Tsar's regime. When the war first broke out in 1914, President Wilson proclaimed American neutrality. But naval warfare in Europe reverberated in the United States. Britain declared a naval blockade of Germany and began to stop American merchant vessels. Germany launched submarine warfare against ships entering and leaving British ports in response. In May 1915, a German submarine sank the British liner known as the Lusitania off the coast of Ireland causing the death of nearly 1,200 passengers, including 124 Americans. Here we have the New York Times headlines of the day that related the incident. The sinking of the Lusitania outraged American public opinion and strengthened the hand of those who believed that the U.S. needed to prepare for possible entry into the war. Wilson himself had strong pro-British sympathies, viewing Germany as what he described as the natural foe of liberty. By the end of 1915, he had the country embarked on a policy of what was called preparedness, a crash program to expand the American army. And Navy. In May 1916, Germany announced the suspension of submarine warfare against non combatants. It appeared that Wilson's preparedness program had succeeded in securing the right of American vessels to travel freely on the high seas. He kept us out of the war, became the slogan for Wilson's campaign for re-election. With the Republican Party reunited after its split in 1912, the election proved to be one of the closest in American history. Wilson defeated the Republican candidate, Charles Evans Hughes, by only 23 electoral votes and about 600,000 popular votes out of more than 18 million that were cast in the election. Partly because he seemed to promise not to send American soldiers to Europe, Wilson carried 10 of the 12 states that had adopted woman suffrage. Without the votes of women, he would not have been reelected. Almost immediately, however, Germany announced its intention to resume submarine warfare against sailing to or from the British Isles, and several American merchant vessels were sunk. Then in March 1917 came the straw that broke the camel's back, when British spies intercepted and made public 
what became known as the Zimmermann Telegram, a message by German Foreign Secretary Arthur Zimmermann calling on Mexico to join in a coming war against the United States and promising to help it recover territory lost to the U.S. in the Mexican War of 1846 to 1848. Here again we have the New York Times headlines of the day. On April 2nd, an outraged Wilson went before Congress to ask for a declaration of war against Germany. The world, he proclaimed, must be made safe for democracy. The war resolution passed the Senate 82 to 6 and the House 373 to 50. It would not be until the spring of 1918, however, that American troops arrived in Europe in significant numbers. And by then, the world situation had taken a dramatic turn. In November 1917, a communist revolution headed by Vladimir Lenin overthrew the Russian government. Here we have an image of Lenin and one from the streets of Petrograd taken during the revolution. Just a couple of months later, in January 1918, Wilson issued what became known as the 14 Points, the clearest statement of American war aims to date, and including the president's vision of a new international order. Among the key principles espoused were self-determination for all nations, freedom of the seas, the readjustment of colonial claims with colonized peoples given equal weight in deciding their futures, and the creation of a general association of nations to preserve the peace, what would later become the League of Nations, precursor to the United Nations or UN of today. The 14 points established the agenda for the peace conference that followed the war. The United States threw its resources and manpower into the conflict. And when American troops did finally arrive in Europe, they helped to turn the tide of battle. In the spring of 1918, they helped repulse a German advance near Paris. And by July, were participating in a major Allied counteroffensive. In September, in what became known as the Meuse-Argonne campaign, more than one million American soldiers under General John J. Pershing helped push back the outnumbered and exhausted German army. Here we have an image of U.S. troops pinned down in the Argonne Forest during the fighting. With his forces now in full retreat, on November 9th, 1918, the German Kaiser abdicated, and just two days later, Germany sued for peace. Over 100,000 Americans had died, a substantial number, but they represented just 1% of the 10 million soldiers killed in the Great War. For most progressives, the First World War offered the possibility of reforming American society along scientific lines, instilling a sense of national unity and self-sacrifice, even expanding social justice. 
that American power could now disseminate progressive values around the globe heightened the war's appeal. Almost without exception, progressive intellectuals and reformers, joined by prominent labor leaders and even some native-born socialists, rallied to Wilson's support. Just as in the case of the American Civil War, World War I created a national state with unprecedented powers and a markedly increased presence in Americans' everyday lives. Under what became known as the Selective Service Act of May 1917, 24 million men were required to register for the military draft. New federal agencies moved to regulate industry, transportation, labor relations, and agriculture. What was called the War Industries Board presided over all elements of production, from the distribution of raw materials to the prices of manufactured goods. During the war years, wages for workers rose substantially. Working conditions in many industries improved, and union membership doubled. The enlistment of both democracy and freedom as ideological weapons during the war, emphasized, for example, in Wilson's 14 points, inevitably inspired demands for their expansion at home. In 1916, Wilson had cautiously endorsed votes for women. America's entry into the war had initially threatened a rift within the suffrage movement, since many women opposed U.S. involvement. But again, just as in the Civil War, once the fighting actually started, most leaders of the suffrage movement rallied to support the troops. Women sold war bonds, organized patriotic rallies, and, as we see in this image, even went to work in war production jobs. Some 22,000 served as clerical workers and nurses with American forces in Europe. At the same time, a new generation of college-educated activists organized in the National Women's Party started to press for the right to vote with a set of militant tactics that many older suffrage advocates found scandalous. Here we have an image of a suffragette parade in Washington, D.C. from the period. The National Women's Party was led by Alice Paul, who we see in this photograph. She had studied in England between 1907 and 1910 when the British suffrage movement was adopting a strategy that included things like arrests, imprisonments, and vigorous denunciations of a male-dominated political system. Paul compared Wilson to the Kaiser during the war years, and a group of her followers chained themselves to the fence of the White House an act which garnered them a seven-month-long prison sentence. When they began a hunger strike during their incarceration, the prisoners were force-fed. The combination of women's patriotic service during the war, along with widespread outrage over the treatment of Paul and her fellow prisoners, pushed the Wilson administration finally toward full-fledged support of the suffrage movement. In 1920, of course, the long struggle ended with ratification of the 19th Amendment, which finally barred states from using sex as a qualification for voting. In 
the First World War also gave a powerful impulse to other campaigns that had engaged the energies of women in the progressive era. Prohibition, a movement inherited from the 19th century that gained new strength and militancy in progressive America, finally achieved national success in the war years. Employers hoped it would create a more disciplined labor force. Urban reformers believed it would promote a more orderly city environment and undermine urban political machines, which frequently used saloons and bars as places to organize. Women reformers hoped prohibition would protect wives and children from husbands who engaged in domestic violence when drunk or who squandered their wages on drink. Many native-born white Protestants saw prohibition as a way of imposing American values on immigrants. After some success at the state level, prohibitionists came to see national legislation as their best strategy. The war gave them added ammunition. Many prominent breweries of the time were owned by German Americans, which for many made beer seem unpatriotic. In December 1917, Congress passed the 18th Amendment, prohibiting the manufacture and sale of intoxicating liquor. It was ratified by the states in 1919 and went into effect at the beginning of 1920. Here we have an image of police busting up barrels of booze. Despite widespread support for the measure, opposition to prohibition was also immense, as we can get an idea from this photograph, which makes pretty clear the protesters' feelings, at least in terms of what they wanted, right? Beer. World War I ultimately raised some serious questions for the country. Questions that would be revisited many times over in the years and decades ahead. What is the balance between security and freedom? Does the Constitution protect citizens' rights during wartime? Should dissent be equated with a lack of patriotism? Despite the Wilson administration's idealistic language of democracy and freedom, the First World War inaugurated, up to that time, the most intense repression of civil liberties in American history. During the war, the federal government enacted laws to restrict freedom of speech. What was known as the Espionage Act of 1917 prohibited not only spying and doing things like interfering with the military draft, but also so-called false statements that might in some way impede military success. The Postmaster General barred from the mails numerous magazines and newspapers critical of the Wilson administration. In 1918, what was called the Sedition Act made it a crime to deliver spoken or printed statements that intended to cast contempt, scorn, or disrepute on the form of government, or that advocated interference with the war effort. In one case, just to provide an example, an Ohio court sentenced John White, a farmer, to 21 months in prison for saying something that was indisputably true, 
that the murder of innocent women and children by German soldiers was no worse than what the United States had done in the Philippines in the War of 1899 to 1903. While it was never a large number, some citizens during the war years took to the streets in protest of these governmental violations of citizens' rights under the Constitution, as we can see in this photograph from the time taken just outside the White House. From the federal government to state and local authorities and private groups, patriotism came to be equated with support for the government, the war, and the American economic system. Across the country, schools revised their course offerings to ensure their patriotism and required teachers to sign loyalty oaths. The 250,000 members of the newly formed American Protective League, or APL, helped the Justice Department identify radicals and critics of the war by spying on their neighbors. Employers cooperated with the government in the war years in a successful effort to destroy the industrial workers of the world, the Wobblies, a move that had long been demanded by business interests. In September 1917, operating under one of the broadest warrants in American history, federal agents swooped down on IWW offices throughout the country, arresting hundreds of leaders and seizing files and publications. Although some progressives of the time protested individual excesses, most failed to speak out against the widespread violation of freedom of expression. Civil liberties, by and large, had never been a major concern of progressives, because they had always viewed the national state as the embodiment of democratic purpose, insisting that freedom flowed from participating in the life of society, not standing in opposition. Strong believers in the use of national power to improve social conditions, progressives found themselves ill-equipped to develop a defense of minority rights against majority or governmental tyranny. Even before American participation in World War I, what contemporaries called the race problem meaning the tensions that arose from the country's increasing ethnic diversity, had become a major subject of public interest and concern. Race, of course, referred to far more than black-white relations in America. The Dictionary of Races of Peoples, published in 1911, by the U.S. Immigration Commission, listed no fewer than 45 immigrant races then living in the United States, each supposedly with its own inborn characteristics. Here we have an image from the work that provides some idea of its content. The New Science of eugenics, which studied the alleged mental characteristics of different races, gave anti-immigrant sentiment an air of professional expertise in these years. The extreme nationalization of politics and economic life served to heighten people's awareness of ethnic and racial difference spurring demands for the Americanization of immigrant communities. Public 
and private groups of all kinds, including educators, employers, labor leaders, social reformers, and public officials, all took up this task of Americanizing the new immigrants. Fearful that adult newcomers remain too stuck in their old world ways, public schools paid great attention to Americanizing immigrants' children. Only a tiny number of progressives questioned these Americanization efforts and actually insisted upon respect for immigrant subcultures. But one of them was Randolph Bourne, who we see in this image. His 1916 essay, Transnational America, exposed the fundamental flaw in the Americanization model. As Bourne noted, there is no distinctive American culture. It was the interaction between individuals and groups from literally all parts of the globe that had produced things like the country's music, its poetry, its art, and other cultural expressions. Born envisioned a democratic, cosmopolitan society in which immigrants and natives alike submerged their group identities into a new transnational culture. If any group bore the brunt of forced Americanization, it was German Americans. By 1914, German Americans numbered nearly 9 million, including immigrants and persons of German parentage. They'd created thriving ethnic institutions such as clubs, sports associations, schools, and theaters. On the eve of the war, many Americans admired German traditions in literature, music, and philosophy, and one quarter of all the high school students in the country studied the German language. But after American entry into the First World War, the use of German and expressions of German culture became a target of pro-war organizations. By 1919, the vast majority of the states had enacted laws restricting the teaching of foreign languages. Popular words of German origin were changed. Hamburgers became Liberty Sandwiches and sauerkraut was renamed Liberty Cabbage. The government jailed Karl Muck, the director of the Boston Symphony Orchestra and a Swiss citizen who we see in this photo, because he refused to stop performing the works of German composers, such as Beethoven. Even as Americanization programs sought to assimilate immigrants into American society, the war strengthened the conviction that certain kinds of undesirable persons ought to be excluded altogether. No matter how coercive, however, Americanization programs assumed that European immigrants, and especially their children, could eventually adjust to the conditions of American life, embrace American ideals, and become productive citizens enjoying the full blessings of American freedom. This assumption did not apply to non-white immigrants or to blacks. The war led to the further growth of the Southwest's Mexican population. Wartime demand for labor from the region's mine owners and large farmers 
led the government to exempt Mexicans temporarily from the literacy test enacted in 1917. Segregation by law and custom was common in schools, hospitals, theaters, and other institutions in states with significant Mexican populations. By 1920, nearly all Mexican children in California and the Southwest were educated in their own schools or classrooms. Even more restrictive were policies toward Asian Americans. In 1906, the San Francisco School Board ordered all Asian students confined to a single public school. When the Japanese government protested, President Theodore Roosevelt persuaded the city to rescind the order. He then proceeded to negotiate what became known as the Gentlemen's Agreement of 1907, whereby Japan agreed to end migration to the United States, except for the wives of men already in the country. By far the largest non-white group, African Americans, were excluded from nearly every progressive definition of freedom. After their disfranchisement in the South, few could participate in American democracy. Barred from joining most unions and from skilled employment, black workers had little access to so-called industrial freedom. Nor could blacks, the majority desperately poor, participate fully in the emerging consumer economy either as employees in the new department stores, unless it be as a janitor or a cleaning woman, or as purchasers of the consumer goods now flooding the marketplace. Progressive intellectuals, social scientists, labor reformers, and suffrage advocates displayed a remarkable indifference to the plight of black Americans. Even most settlement house workers accepted segregation as natural and equitable. White leaders of the woman's suffrage movement said almost nothing about black disfranchisement. Woodrow Wilson's administration imposed Jim Crow racial segregation in federal departments and dismissed numerous black federal employees. The president also allowed D.W. Griffith's film Birth of a Nation, which glorified the Ku Klux Klan as the defender of white civilization during Reconstruction, to be officially premiered at the White House in 1915. Here we have a photograph of Griffith along with an image from the film. Black leaders struggled to find a strategy that might rekindle the national commitment to equality that had flickered brightly, if briefly, during the Reconstruction years. No one thought more deeply, or over so long a period, about the black condition and the challenge it posed to American democracy than the scholar and activist W.E.B. Du Bois, who we can see in this image. Born in 1868 and educated at Fisk and Harvard universities, Du Bois lived to his 95th year. His book, The Souls of Black Folk, published in 1903, 
issued a call for blacks to press for equal rights. He believed that educated African Americans like himself, what he called the talented tenth of the black community, should use their education and training to challenge inequality. In 1905, Du Bois gathered a group of black leaders together at Niagara Falls and organized the Niagara Movement, which sought to reinvigorate the abolitionist tradition of the 19th century. We claim for ourselves, he declared in the group's manifesto, every single right that belongs to a freeborn American. Four years later, in 1909, Du Bois joined with a group of mostly white reformers, shocked by a lynching that occurred in the hometown of Abraham Lincoln, Springfield, Illinois, to create the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or the NAACP, as it's more commonly known today. The organization launched a long struggle for the enforcement of the 14th and 15th Amendments, one that obviously continues right up to the present. Outside of these efforts, the progressive period witnessed virtually no progress toward racial justice. Among black Americans, the World War I era language of freedom inspired hopes for a radical change in the country's racial system. The black press rallied to the war. As many recalled, it was black military participation in the Civil War that it helped to secure the destruction of slavery and the achievement of citizenship. But during the First World War, closing ranks did not bring significant gains. The Navy barred blacks entirely, and the segregated army confined most of the 400,000 blacks who served in the war to supply units rather than combat. Here we have in this image one of the few black fighting units of the war, known as the Harlem Hellfighters. The conflict did ultimately unleash social changes that altered the contours of American race relations. The combination of increased wartime production and a drastic fall off in immigration from Europe once the war broke out, opened thousands of industrial jobs for the very first time to black laborers, inspiring a large scale migration from south to north. In this photograph, we see some of the migrants waiting to make the journey above the Mason-Dixon line. On the eve of World War I, 90% of the African American population still lived in the South. But between 1910 and 1920, half a million blacks left the region. The black population of Chicago more than doubled, while New York City's rose 66% and smaller industrial cities like Akron, Ohio, Buffalo, New York, and Trenton, New Jersey showed similar gains. Many motives sustained what came to be called the Great Migration. Among them, higher wages in northern factories than were available in the South, opportunities for educating their children, escape from the threat of lynching and the prospect of exercising the right to vote. The black migrants 
mostly young men and women, on the whole, encountered vast disappointments, including restricted employment opportunities, exclusion from unions, rigid housing segregation, and finally, outbreaks of violence that made it clear no part of the country was free of racial hostility. The increased presence of what came to be known as the New Negro on the streets of American cities, along with growing demands for change inspired by the war, had created a racial tinderbox that needed only an incident to trigger an explosion. In 1917, when employers in East St. Louis, Illinois, began to recruit black workers in an effort to weaken the labor unions in the city, a race riot broke out that led to the killing of dozens of blacks. In this image, we can see some of the crowds that gathered in the midst of the riot. And in this one, a black family attempting to flee the violence. In 1919, more than 250 people died in race riots that exploded in northern cities. The worst episode that year occurred in Chicago, touched off when white bathers at Lake Michigan drowned a black teenager who accidentally crossed the unofficial, meaning non-existent, dividing line between the so-called black and white beaches. By the time the National Guard was able to restore order, 38 persons had been killed and more than 500 injured. Here we have a couple of images from the violence in Chicago. Police uh, attempting to identify a black victim of the riot. And here, a man trying to flee from the white mobs that roamed the streets of the city. The violence was not confined to the North. 76 persons were lynched in the South in 1919 alone, including several black veterans of the war who were in their military uniforms. The single worst race riot in American history occurred in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in 1921, when more than 300 blacks were killed and over 10,000 left homeless after a white mob, including police and National Guardsmen, burned an all-black section of the city to the ground. Here we have a couple of images from Tulsa of a black church in flames. and the remains of a black neighborhood in the wake of the violence. The year 1919 was one of complete chaos and upheaval in the United States. Beyond the race riots, a worldwide flu pandemic that claimed over 20 million lives, claimed 700,000 Americans. It was also the most dramatic year of labor unrest in the country's history. Among aggrieved workers, the wartime language linking patriotism with freedom and democracy, inspired hopes that an era of social justice and economic empowerment 
was at hand. In 1919, more than 4 million workers engaged in strikes, marking the greatest wave of labor unrest the country had ever seen. There were walkouts, among many others, by textile workers, telephone operators, even Broadway actors. They were met by an unprecedented mobilization of employers, government, and private and patriotic organizations. The wartime rhetoric of economic democracy and freedom helped to inspire the era's greatest labor walkout, the 1919 steel strike. Centered in Chicago, it united some 365,000 mostly immigrant workers in demands for union recognition, higher wages, and an eight-hour workday. We see some of the strikers here in this image from the Windy City. In response to the strike, steel magnates launched a concerted counterattack. Employers appealed to anti-immigrant sentiment among native-born workers, many of whom returned to their jobs, and they conducted a propaganda campaign that associated the strikers with the IWW, communism, and disloyalty. With middle-class opinion turning against the labor movement and the increased brutality of police assaulting workers in the streets, the strike collapsed in early 1920. The wartime repression of dissent reached its peak with what became known as the Red Scare of 1919-1920, a short-lived but intense period of political intolerance inspired by the post-war strike wave and the social tensions and fears generated by the successful Russian Revolution. Convinced that episodes like the steel strike of 1919 was part of a global communist conspiracy, Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer, who we see in this photograph, in November 1919 and again in January 1920, dispatched federal agents to raid the offices of radical and labor organizations throughout the country. This was a typical scene from what were called the Palmer Raids. More than 5,000 leaders and other individuals were arrested, most of them without warrants and held for months without charge. The government soon deported hundreds of immigrant radicals. The abuse of civil liberties in 1920 was so severe that Palmer came under heavy criticism from Congress and much of the press. But in their immediate impact, the events of 1919 and 1920 dealt a devastating setback to radical and labor organizations of all kinds and kindled an intense identification of patriotic Americanism with support for the political and economic status quo. The IWW had been effectively destroyed, and even many moderate unions lay in disarray. The beating back of demands for fundamental social change was a severe rebuke to the hopes with which so many progressives had enlisted in the war effort. President Wilson's inability to achieve a just peace based on his 14 points only compounded the sense of failure. Late in 1918, 
He traveled to France to attend the Versailles Peace Conference, from which we have an image here. Along with one of Wilson's seated with the leaders of France, Great Britain, and Italy. What ultimately became the Versailles Treaty did accomplish some of Wilson's goals. It established the League of Nations, the body that was central to his vision of a new international order. It applied the principle of self-determination to Eastern Europe, redrawing the map of that region from the ruins of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and parts of Germany and Tsarist Russia, new European nations emerged from the war, including Finland, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Austria, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, and Yugoslavia. Some of these new states enjoyed an ethno-linguistic unity, where others were comprised of highly unstable combinations of diverse nationalities and cultures. Despite Wilson's pledge of a peace without territorial acquisition or vengeance, the Versailles Treaty was a harsh document that all but guaranteed future conflict in Europe. The British Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, persuaded Wilson to agree to a clause declaring Germany morally responsible for the war and setting astronomical reparations you know, payments that effectively crippled the German economy. What the victorious Allied leaders at Versailles missed was that just like the ideals of the American Revolution of 1776, the Wilsonian rhetoric of self-determination had reverberated across the globe during the war years, particularly among oppressed minorities including blacks in the United States, and colonial peoples seeking their independence. These groups took Wilson's rhetoric more seriously, obviously, than he did. The leading Arabic newspaper of the time, Al-Aram, published in Egypt, then under British control, gave extensive coverage to the president's speech asking Congress to declare war in the name of democracy and to the 14 points. In Beijing, students demanding that China free itself from foreign domination gathered at the American Embassy where they chanted the slogan, Long Live Wilson. Japan proposed to include in the new charter of the League of Nations a clause recognizing the equality of all people, regardless of race. The advocates of colonial independence descended on Paris at the end of 1918 to lobby the peace negotiators. Arabs demanded that a unified, independent state be carved from the old Ottoman Empire in the Middle East. Vietnamese pressed their people's claim for greater rights within the French Empire. W.B. Du Bois organized a Pan-African Congress in Paris that put forward the idea of a self-governing nation to be carved out of Germany's African colonies. Koreans, East Indians, Irish, and others pressed claims for self-determination at the Versailles Peace Conference. The British and the French, however, had no intention of applying the principle of self-determination to their own empires. <laughs> 
During the war, the British had encouraged Arab nationalism as a weapon against the Ottoman Empire and had also pledged at the same time to create a homeland in Palestine for the persecuted Jews of Europe. But when the war was over, the victorious Allied powers proceeded to divide Ottoman lands into a series of new territories, including Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, and Palestine, which were to be controlled not by Arabs or Jews, but by the Allies under so-called League of Nations mandates. Former German colonies in Africa and Asia were taken over by Japan, Australia, and South Africa. Nor did Ireland achieve its independence at Versailles. And as for the Japanese proposal to establish the principle of racial equality within the League of Nations, Woodrow Wilson, with the support of Great Britain, engineered its defeat. Disappointment at the failure to apply the 14 points to the non-European world worked to create a pervasive cynicism about Western nations' use of the language of freedom and democracy. Wilson's willingness to accede to the demands of the imperial powers sparked a series of popular protest movements across the Middle East and Asia, along with the rise of a new anti-Western nationalism. Some leaders, like Ho Chi Minh, who we see in this image, turned to communism, in whose name he would lead Vietnam's long and bloody struggle for independence. The Soviet leader, Lenin, had actually spoken of the right of nations to self-determination before Wilson, and soon it was Lenin's reputation in the colonial world that began to gain in prestige and influence. Whether communist or not, these movements all announced the emergence of a anti-colonial nationalism that would become a major force in world affairs. It would remain that way for the rest of the 20th century. One final disappointment awaited Wilson upon his return from Europe. In his view, the League of Nations was the war's finest legacy. But many Americans feared that membership in the League would commit the United States to an open-ended involvement in the affairs of other countries. A considerable majority of senators would have accepted the treaty with reservations, specifically with an assurance that the obligation to assist League members against attack did not supersede the power of Congress to declare war. Convinced, however, that the treaty reflected what he called the hand of God, Wilson refused to negotiate with congressional leaders. And then in October 1919, in the midst of the League debate, Wilson suffered a serious stroke. Although the extent of his illness was kept secret, he remained incapacitated for the rest of his term in office. In November 1919 and again in March 1920, the U.S. Senate rejected the Versailles Treaty, ushering in a period of retreat by the country from involvement in world affairs often referred to as American isolationism. U.S. involvement in the First World War had lasted barely 19 months, but it cast a long shadow over the rest of the 20th century. 
In its immediate aftermath, as we've noted, the nation backed away from international involvements. But in the long run, Wilson's combination of idealism and power politics had an enduring impact. His appeals to democracy, open markets, and a special American mission to instruct the world in freedom, coupled with a willingness to intervene abroad militarily to promote American interests and values, effectively created the model for 20th century international relations. On its own terms, the war to make the world safe for democracy failed. It also led to the eclipse of progressivism. The Republican candidate for the presidency in 1920, Warren G. Harding, who we have here in our final image, had no connection with the party's progressive wing. He swept to victory in the election that year by promising Americans what he called a return to normalcy, along with a rejection of what he termed Wilsonism. Harding received 60% of the popular vote in 1920. Begun with idealistic goals and grand hopes for social change, U.S. involvement in the Great War ultimately laid the foundation for one of the most conservative decades in the nation's history, ironically known by the moniker, the Roaring Twenties, which is where we'll pick things up next time.